We are uh, teaching through 1 Timothy, and we are going to be in chapter 5, 1 Timothy 5. We are live all over the world right now, so wherever you're at, I'm so glad you're here. Do me a huge favor. Whatever device you're watching us on, if you'd like and share the stream that you're watching, sharing it will help other people trying to find our stream find us. But we are in 1 Timothy 5, and we're going to start in verse 9. So this is an extension of last week. So if you missed, missed me last week, you can look it up on YouTube uh, when you get home. But this is an extension of what we talked about last week, which is this. Who should the church actually take care of? Who should the church actually take care of? Because we live in a culture that just because somebody asks for something, we feel like they need to be given it. And so Paul actually is going to tell us who qualifies to get help from a church and what happens if you have too much energy and nowhere to put it? And this directly relates to the young ladies in here. So here we go. <laughs> First Timothy 5.9, let a widow be enrolled, circle enrolled, if she is not less than 60 years of age, underline 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband, underline one husband, and having a reputation, circle reputation, of good works. If she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, circle hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared, circle cared, for the afflicted, and is devoted, circle devoted, herself to every good work, but refuse to enroll younger widows, for when their passions, circle passions, draw them away from Christ, underline draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry. And so incur condemnation for having abandoned, circle abandoned, their former faith. Underline former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers, circle idlers, going around from house to house, and not only idlers, but gossips, circle gossips, and busybodies, circle busybodies, saying what they should not say. So I would have younger widows marry, circle marry, have children, and manage their own households, uh, circle manage, and give the adversary no occasion for slander, circle slander. Underline verse, six, uh, verse 15, for some have already strayed after Satan. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows. Woo! Woo! Everybody ready? So let me bring you up to speed. Last week, which is, this week is an extension of last week. Last week I talked about this idea that just because somebody wants something, does the church, does the church slash Christians, because the church are Christians, church isn't a building or a, a place, church is people, church is me and you. So should the church, us, Fill every person's need just because they ask us. So for many of us, we'd say, well, no, it doesn't really make much sense because if somebody walked up to me and said, gosh, I really need a house, give me yours. Well, where's my family going to live? I really don't care. Take them under a bridge by the freeway. Well, I guess Jesus just wants us to keep giving everything to everyone who asks, so I guess I should just give my house and my car and put my family in peril. Is that what God is asking us? Or is there qualifications for how the church should handle the financing of people who are really in need? In other words, who's really in need? Just because somebody asks? Or is there a list of things that goes, here's how we know who's really in need? So the church was dealing with these things 2,000 years ago. This church out of 1 Timothy, the lead guy was Timothy, who was the lead pastor of a church at Ephesus. The apostle Paul wrote him this letter to go, this is the way a church should function. So if the Apostle Paul was my mentor and wrote me a letter because he left me here to, to, to pastor the orchard in Temecula, you know, this, this letter would have been called like First Pastor Jim or whatever. And I'd be telling you like, here's how the orchard should function. Like it's literally that organic. So if you got your notes, pull them out. I, if you came on campus, you should have my notes in a bulletin that you were given. If you're watching online at the top of the comments section on Facebook is a link. You can click on that link. And number one is this. <clears throat> Christians help the helpless for God. Christians help the helpless for God. So let me help you with this. 
many of you um, have been bouncing around at church, churches to churches for years. So you visit one church, you stay there for like two weeks, you visit another church, you kind of go, oh, I'm just checking everything out. Here's the thing, son. Land the stinking plane. Some of you guys have been flying around for 30 or 40 years in this valley going, I'm still trying to look for the church that I want to go to. Listen to me. Church is a family. So when you walk in, it's not, this isn't Walmart or Target where you walk in and go, where's the stuff I want? Oh, it's in aisle seven. The church is like being invited into a family for dinner. Come on in and eat with us. I hope, I hope you want to stay here because we would love to have you be part of the family. So you need to change the way you view church. American church is very consumeristic. What's in it for me? What, do I like this place? Is it air conditioning the right temperature for my butt? <laughs> Rather than going, is this a family? Are these are people I want to get invested with and become and do life together. So church is about family. It's not about um, shopping. So many of us have been flying around this valley for decades going, I'm looking for a church. Okay, land the plane. If you're shopping, buy something and stay here. And if you don't like it here, then go somewhere else, but stay there. Stay there and be family. Stop looking at churches as, as a place to get rather than a place to be a part of a, of, of a family of people. I say that because here's the thing. Family takes care of family. So when family's in need, family takes care of those in need. How do we know who's really in need versus like when your teenager goes, I want, I need the new iPhone. What's wrong with the Nokia flip phone you got from like 1997? <laughs> Still works, right? I know you can't get pictures and can't send a text, but you can always call your mom and that's all that matters to you, my daughter. So here we go. How do we know who's really in need? Because as a family, we should take care of family. That's what a church does. People at Target and Walmart don't take care of you. You just buy stuff from them. But family takes care of family. That's why church is different. So let's look at it. Christians help the helpless for God. Once Paul instructed Timothy that elderly parents should be cared for by their own family, which is what we looked at last week, he describes the type of people that the church should actually care for. Timothy is to enroll widows that meet a certain criteria. So it's interesting. Look at uh, 1 Timothy 5, verse 9, the very first verse of today. Let a widow be enrolled. That Greek word literally means to, to write down on a list. So here's what's interesting, because it goes right into membership, the idea that we're family, we're part of one another. Paul tells Timothy to put these widows down on a list, and then he, he gives the qualifications to how to get on that list. Well, let's look at the qualifications. She has to be over 60. So this is the idea that when uh, ladies get older, they're 60, 70, 80 years old, they've lost their ability to like create income because they physically just can't do either you know, laborious work, physical work, or whatever's going on with their, their maybe they have ailments physically. They just can't, they can't go out and work anymore. So somebody's got to take care of them. Their husband's dead. So they're elderly widows. So they have to be over 60 to get on this list. A faithful wife, so in your, in your Bible it says this, uh, a, a wife of one husband, and it's very similar to when a, a pastor is to be chosen, they're, they're to be known as a, a one-woman man. It doesn't mean that if my wife died, I can't remarry. What it means is, it's basically like one wife at a time. <laughs> and... And when you've got a wife, you are devoted to that one wife. You don't have a side chick. You don't have a sneaky link. You don't have like things going on in the background, right? So that's the idea here. So the, when it says the, the Greek, the Greek idea is this. Are you married? Yep. Okay. Then you are devoted to that one person until they're dead. You don't, you don't sneak around. You're not flirting around. You're not trying to find another, you know, you're not dating while you're married. So it's the same thing is true for the women, which is, which is true for qualifications for men to lead a church, is women that are going to make this list are the elderly women who can't generate income anymore, and they're women who have been known as faithful to their husbands. They haven't been sleeping around, they haven't been, you know, trying to do other stuff, they've been like connected to their husband for their, their whole lives. She uh, has a reputation for working hard and raising children, so if the majority of 
people that get married, especially in the first century, they wanted children because that's, that was your social security when you got older was to have large families. So it's, if you've ever been in a large family, it can be difficult to run a home with a lot of kids in it. It's difficult to run a home with one screaming infant, <laughs> much less an infant and add three or four others on there and a husband who acts like an infant sometimes. So women have a hard time running homes that have a lot of children in them. But she's devoted to that. She's, she's hospitable. So ladies, one of the biggest gifts that God has given women is the ability to be hospitable. So men are to be hospitable too, but there's something unique about femininity that creates environments of just welcome. Like when you walk into most like single guys' homes, you wonder what disease you're getting as you're walking in there, as you have to like push pizza boxes off the you know, couch to sit on it or whatever. But many times when you walk into somebody's married home, when a woman kind of has her own little space to call home or her own little nest, it's like you feel like this is home, like a place that I'm connected to. And so one of the gifts of femininity is the idea that you're welcome here. When you come into our home, you're not a stranger. Like it doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be an expensive home. It could just be a small apartment or whatever. But like when you walk in, you don't feel like I'm not welcome here. That's what hospitality means. It means you're just like family to me. When you come into my home, hey, you're just like family. Hey, come eat something. Hey, come sit on the couch. Here, let me move the cat outside. (laughs) Sit on the couch. Enjoy yourself. So that's the idea of being hospitable. So for most, for most women, that's, that's a gift of God. It's because you want your home to feel like something, not just a place people land when, at the end of work, but you want it to feel like, man, I, this, is a, this is home to us. It's not just a, a place we dwell. And is devoted to serving others. So watch, this means that these women that he just described, all that list of, of qualifications, mean that they were members of the church as they were known by their service and character. So I'm going to go after this. You can't imagine how many times we do our Discover the Orchard class, which is our membership class. And people say this, or I'll hear this, I'll get an email like, there's no membership in the Bible. I go, have you read the Bible? Yeah, I read the Bible. I don't see membership anywhere. Literally read 1 Corinthians. It says we're members of one another. You know what the two illustrations of being a Christian is? You're part of a new family and you're part of a body. How much more of a member can you be than if you're attached onto an arm of a body? You're you're about as membered up as you can be. When you're in a family, you're a member of that family. How much more membered up can you be when you share the last name with people in your family and you come home to the same people? That's as membership as you can be. Membership's all over the Bible. So I was a part of Calvary Chapel for a long time, and that was the pastor always said, like, there's no membership in the Bible. That's why we don't have membership. And then I started reading the Bible. I'm like, they didn't need to have a class in the first century for membership, but we need to because we've had 2,000 years of really bad teaching on, on, on the church. So we have, a, we have a class just to help people understand what we mean by it, but membership's all over in the Bible. The illustrations are a body and a family. You can't be more membered up than that. So here's the reason I tell you that, is because these women are known by their character and what they've done, which means that they're members of that church. They're not just pe- women that shopping around for a church and they just bounce in and out. These are women that are invested, which means they knew them. They knew them long term. So whether they had an official membership or not, they were members of that church. They were part of that family. And here's our principle. Our first principle is this. Membership matters. I'm going to go after this. If you you have been coming to this church for for a while, stop shopping and buy something. Land the plane. Some of you guys have been buzzing around this valley for decades. Stop that. Like I said, you don't like me. You don't like the color of our carpet, whatever. You're like, I'm out of here. Okay, then go somewhere else, but stay there and serve them. Be a part of that family then. Stop shopping. Be a member because membership matters. This is why it matters because Timothy just laid out a whole bunch of qualifications for a woman that's been there for probably decades. They knew her character. I want you to... I want to show you in a graphic how we move everybody through this. So find yourself on this graphic. So you attend, you show up. I'm coming and seeing what's going on here. Awesome. If this is you today, your first time here, you've been here a month or two months or whatever, awesome. I'm glad you're here. So I come and see what's going on. The next is, literally Pastor Bill just talked about this from the stage. There's a Discover the Orchard class uh, that's going to be coming up. We do it about every five weeks. 
This is the only place I've ever been where people go, I can't wait till the next class. Can you do a private class? They like ask our pastors, like, I can't, I can't wait. I got to get in here and start serving. It's like people don't even go to the gym that they pay for every month. But people come here and they go, dude, this is, the God's here. Like, let's get going. That, that without joking, it probably happened 15 to 20 times in the last five years where people go, I can't wait, I can't wait a month. Like, I want to get going now. Can we do like it online or whatever? So we have Discover the Orchard every four to five weeks. All that is is says, here's who we are. You should never join a place where you don't know their theology, you don't know their history, you don't know where they're going, you don't know anything about the pastor, you don't know anything about it. Know what you're getting into. Because many of us have been going to churches and they have whack theology. And you didn't even know it until years later. Hey, there's no hell. Hey, we're all about social you know, good or whatever. It's like the reason you have to be about social good is because Jesus left the building 10 years ago and you didn't notice. Because now all you're left with is what should we do for the community rather than people need to get saved first. So know what a church believes. That's what we do, discover the orchard. Here's our pathway to becoming a member. We do a pastoral interview. After that class, you go, dude, I want to be a part of this church, man. What do I, I got to do? You sit down with the pastor. We do a one-on-one interview to answer any questions you, you may have so you get some clarity. And then we make sure that uh, two things have happened in your life, that you've been saved, that you understand the gospel, and you repented of your sin. That's how you enter the family of God. You become a member of the family of God. Maybe you haven't done that yet, or maybe you've been a Christian for decades. We just find out if you're saved and if, if you got baptized. So Jesus commands us to be baptized. It's not optional. So if you've been a Christian for a long time, you're like, oh, I don't really know if, I'm, if that's important to me or blah, blah. It's actually important to Jesus. So if you call yourself a Christian, you need to get baptized. So if you've been sprinkled like I was as a Lutheran, um, that's not a baptism. That's a sprinkling. And so you need to get baptized. Okay, it's, there's two different things. Um, once those two things have happened, actually we're having a baptism class. Uh, Pastor Bill just talked about that coming up in a couple weeks. Church presentation, we present you to the church. Almost every week at every service, I've got people join our, our, our church. We, we present you with the deacon family, and uh, that, those are the touch points to the church, so you never feel like you're not connected to family. That's why we give you a deacon family to walk alongside of you once you become a member. We present you to the church. We say, go, hey, welcome these new people that are joining our family. And then we ask you to serve. Hey, you got a gift. Serve. Do something. Don't do nothing. God, God's put a passion in your heart, whether it's work with children or work security or work with people that don't like people. Like, work with somebody. Do things. Don't do nothing. Don't come here and sit for an hour and go, I go to church. Stop that. It's family. Family serves one another. You, you'll be served by people that love you, and you should love other people too. So don't qu- stop wandering around this valley. Sit, land and serve. Use your gifts. You'll, you'll be fill the joy of God in your heart when you serve others. And then that's the last step is just belonging. We're now part of the family. So that's our process. Go from I attend the orchard to now I belong at the orchard. That's how you go from I'm not part of the family to I'm now part of the family. That's our process. So if you've ever been unclear about how a biblical process is, that's, this, is uh, this is how we function. The reason I give you this graphic is because in this story, the, the widows are known They're not just random women that go, I want something. They're known by their lifestyle. And that means people are involved and integrated into their life. God's heart is to show his care for the most vulnerable and destitute in the church. As an example to the world, the church and every believer aren't called to fill every need or finance every request. Just because some, hey, well, ready, it's going to hurt some of your feelers, but I don't care. Here we go. Just because someone doesn't want to help themselves doesn't mean they are helpless. Oh, snap. What? Yep. We live in a culture that's basically funded and fostered laziness. So we live in a culture where it goes, I want something from the government or I want somebody to give me something. Are you able-bodied? Could you go get a job? Yeah, but I don't want to. Because I'd rather sit at home and eat Cheetos and play video games or whatever and watch TikTok videos. I would love to do that too. But who's going to, if everybody stayed home and did all those things, who's going to pay for your cell phone bill to watch TikTok videos? Like, like we live in a culture where it's like, I want this. Okay, who's going to fund it? I don't know. Somebody else will. That's actually working. So scripture says this. Are you able-bodied? Yep, my body works. Are you able-minded? Yep, my mind is clear. Then get off your butt and go do something. Fund yourself so you can take care of yourself, and then help fund other people that can't take care of themselves. So the helped 
helps the helpless. And the way you know you're able to help is if you are able-bodied and able-minded. So when you're an elderly widow, you're over 60, 70, 80, you have physical ailments, you, just, you physically can't generate income. Okay, I will help because I'm an able-bodied man that's able to take care of myself, my family, and you. That's how that works. But when everybody who's able-bodied goes, where's my stuff? Then a whole nation falls apart. A whole society falls apart. So scripture says this. If you're able, go get a job. Anybody ever seen any help wanted ads around town? <laughs> so watch. So my son, when he started at CBU, Cal Baptist, uh, four years ago, he's graduating this year. I can't believe it because I'm like 12 years old. I, that's weird. <laughs> I must have had my son before I was born. That's insane. <laughs> my son started at CBU. Job market was tight back then. Like when he was looking at four years to now, he was like, eh, you know, is there going to be any jobs for me? Well, the one good thing, one good thing about COVID is it basically blasted open the job market. Like you could tie a blindfold around your face and just wander into a store. <laughs> hey, you're here. We'd love some help. <laughs> you know, what are the qualifications for working here? Well, do you have a pulse? <laughs> yes, I do. Congratulations. You're in. So the point is this, is there work to be done? Oh yeah, could you make some income? Sure. So do that rather than doing nothing. Help yourself so you can help others too. The way to generosity is work so you can support yourself and be generous to others. Look at 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians 3. 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 through 13. So, so Paul, who wrote 1 Timothy, also wrote 2 Thessalonians. And look what he says about this. So the church at Thessalonica was struggling with people who were being lazy too. Look what he says. So this might relate to some of your teenage sons that are now 58 living in your home. <laughs> Ready? Here we go. Verse 6. Now we command you, brothers... In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who's walking in idleness. In other words, not doing anything, living their life without doing anything. And not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you. Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we don't have that right but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone's not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness. Jesus is calling right now. The alarm's going off. So listen. <laughs> not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. So here's the encouragement, ready? If you're able to work, work. If you're not able to work and you can't feed yourself, then family comes alongside of you. If you have no family that can help because all your family's dead or gone or whatever, then the church, if you are part of a church, takes care of family. But just because you want something doesn't mean you get it. I, I said it last week. You can't imagine how many people walk into the office. I need some money. I come out of my office. Who's giving away money? I'd love, huh, I'd love money too. Who's giving that away? And oftentimes churches, it, so we ask people like, why did you think that you could just walk into a random church with random people you don't even know and go, I need some stuff? Well, this church does it down there and this church and whatever else. And it's like churches have trained our society that instead of working hard for yourself to help others, it's other people work hard to serve me. And these are able-bodied people. They're not committed to anybody. They don't care about anyone else. They're not going to serve anybody else. They just want when they could actually be helping themselves and helping others. Ready? Here's our principle. God's money should be spent God's way. God's money should be spent God's way. And that includes the money that's in your bank account right now. 
I don't know how much money you got in your bank account. It could be 15 bucks. It could be 15 million. Um, God just said tithe on that. So, <laughs> ready? Doesn't matter, I don't, it doesn't matter how much you make. Listen, that is all God's money. It's given to you to manage. So manage it well. Whether you've got a little bit to manage or you have a lot to manage, manage it well and help other people. Let it serve you because you earned it. Let it serve your family because that's your first responsibility. But make sure other people are served by the finances God gave you to manage because that money does not belong to you. It'll just go to someone else when you're dead. That, it's, it's, that money's given to you for a short amount of time, so manage it well while you have it. Do good with it. Which leads us to number two. Ladies, I'm coming after you. Everybody ready? All my ladies, you ready? We got one that's ready. Here we go. Christian women commit to their commitments to God. Christian women commit to their commitments to God. In other words, what they start, they finish. When you commit something to God, ladies, finish the work that God set you to do with it. As has been true throughout history, women usually outlive men. You want to know why that is? One of the women in the first service said, because we're smarter. (laughs) That's actually a little bit true. One of the ways women are smarter is because YouTube is literally filled with like fail and stupid crash videos. And you know what? 99.7% of them are made by 20-something men going, I could totally make that gap. (laughs) Jumping off of roofs, jumping out of planes, getting in fist fights on the street, you know, riding wheelies at 150 miles an hour down the freeway. Almost zero women are in those videos, unless they're on the back of the bike or whatever, about ready to take a digger, right? It's almost always young men, almost always. YouTube's just filled with those crash videos, which tells you women are probably a little bit smarter in that particular arena. But men, when they're in their teens and 20s and 30s, they're just like, their testosterone just fills their body like gasoline. They go, I gotta go do something. Let's jump off a bridge. (laughs) Tied to a rubber band. (laughs) Hopefully I make it. So throughout history, women outlive men. So my wife, chances are, will outlive me. Chances are, if you're married in here, you will outlive your husband, if you're, if you're a woman. And that means you'll be a widow at some point in your life. Men go off to war. Usually women don't go off to war and physically fight up until the recent, you know, recent where you're able to fire a gun or do something from a computer with a drone overseas or whatever. Uh, almost 100% of wars have been fought by men because it's hand-to-hand combat. So chances are you'll lose your husband at war. You lose your husband at work. Most men did a lot of dangerous work 2,000 years ago. There wasn't OSHA or whatever to make sure you were safe at work. You know, the Great Wall of China, it's packed with a bunch of people's bodies inside of there. When they die, they're like, just stuff them in the wall. (laughs) Put some stones over them. It's like you did your job for the country. Good job. Now get in the wall. Like nobody's coming by going, this looks a little unsafe. So men just work and die. Women usually outlast their husbands for many reasons. So chances are, ladies in here, at some point in your life, if you're married, you will become a widow. Chances are high. It was true 2,000 years ago. It's true, true in our day. So now Paul has to deal with the reality that there's a bunch of widows in the church at Ephesus. All of them are saying, I'm a widow. I want some money. Now Paul has to go, just because you want doesn't mean you should get, especially if you're able bodied. Younger widows were not to be put on the needy widow list as, uh, as they were either able to take care of themselves, they can go get their own jobs or whatever, or would get remarried and would be taken care of by their new husband. Wanting to be remarried, some of them would ignore pastoral counsel and marry unbelievers or be drawn away to other beliefs and abandon their faith. woo I'm going to walk into femininity for a second. Everybody Ready? One of the strengths of femininity is relational connection. So women get to, get to deeper relationships way quicker than men, usually through talking. So they like to talk. Ladies usually have the gift of gab. Now, I'm not saying there's not men that can't gab, but by and large, the ladies are like, we can get to quick 
uh, relational depth through talking. Men usually could share like five words a month like, Matt's my bro. How many times have you talked to him? I talked to him like last year. He's my best friend. Ladies are like, you don't have any friends. You don't, you don't talk to anybody. No, I talked to him I, I, that one time I did. So ladies can get to depth of relationship quick. And it's usually through verbal. Girls usually are way more verbal than boys on the playground. Boys are usually crashing things and smashing into people. And girls are usually you know, talking about it and make, they, they have a more, usually a more vivid um, imagination. So the strength of femininity is that. The weakness of femininity is this. The majority of the time, women want to so desperately be in a deep relationship with a guy, they will give up their body for it. And they will oftentimes give up their morals for it as well. So what's happening here is Paul's saying this. There's going to be some people in your church, Timothy, some young women who are younger widows. They're in their 20s. They're in their 30s. They're in their 40s. Their husband died at war. He died of a heart attack. He did whatever. So they're, they're, not, they're not unable to take care of themselves. They can take care of themselves. They go get a job, whatever. They might get remarried. Well, some of your girls that are going to want to get remarried are going to fall in love with a guy that's not even a Christian. He might even look, say he's a Christian. He might go to church. He might talk like a Christian. He might, oh, he's, he's, he's such deep theology. But he doesn't love Jesus because he's not humble. He doesn't listen to any pastoral counsel. He, he's, he's, he's poison for your life. And so Paul tells, these, tells Timothy to tell these young ladies, don't, you have to guard your heart. Because what's going to happen, ladies, is you're going to give your heart to some guy that it will not lead you to Jesus. It happens all the time. It happens in our culture. You can't have many, imagine how many times women walk through the door of our, of our office and they go, hey, I really need some counseling. And we'll sit down with them and through pastoral counseling, this, basically this scenario will come out. Yeah, I just, I'm really struggling with my relationship with, you know, with Johnny. What's going on? Oh, I just, you know, blah, blah, blah. Just, we're living together, but, you know, we're almost married. And it's, it's you know, it's, it's just like being married. And it's, but we're kind of struggling, you know, with sexual, sexual stuff and blah, 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 blah. And we're like, no kidding. Well, let me, tell me about Johnny. Oh, you know, have I ever seen him at church? Oh, no, you know, but he's, he's almost a Christian. You know, I'm going to, we're getting there. Time out. You're a Christian? Yeah, I love Jesus. I've, I've loved Jesus for, for years, decades. You know, I'm just I'm a follower of Jesus. Then why the heck are you with a guy that doesn't love Jesus? But, he's, but I can change him. <laughs> Listen, you can't change a man. Ladies, you cannot change a man. You can nag a man. You can try to influence a man. You will never change a man's heart, which is why Scripture says over and over and over and over and over and over and over, do not be un, unequally yoked with somebody who's not going the same way you are. Because... One path is away from God, one path is to God, and you'll be torn apart. And here's what happens, is women, oftentimes because they have such a, a deep desire to be in a, in a, in a, in a good relationship, they'll, they'll, they'll cling on to a guy that will promise them a lot, and maybe he's even a good guy, maybe he's even friendly, and maybe he's super good looking, and owns a, a sweet car. And they make up all this fantasy in their, in their mind, like, oh, all these things are so good, Jesus becomes secondary. And there'll be some young women that just walk away from God altogether because they want to be in this relationship. And I've seen it happen over and over and over and over and over. One of the weaknesses of femininity, young ladies, is you have to protect your heart. That's why you don't just date random dudes. That's why you should be getting pastoral counsel about the, the, the men you give your heart to because whoever you give your heart to, you give your body to. And when you give your body to that guy, you'll feel... Like, this is it. And you feel bad about yourself and you feel like I might as well just marry him because we're already doing this stuff. We're already, you know, living in sin. Might as well just get married. And then you just make one bad decision after the next bad decision. And Paul says this, there's going to be some that just go, I'd rather be with this guy than be with Jesus. They will, and the Greek word there literally means to, to fall away, to, to purposely walk away from Jesus because I purposely want this guy. Putting their, literally their salvation in peril because it says their former faith. So they were Christians. This isn't some random, almost Christian women. This is, this is their former faith. 
He's talking about it in the past tense, which is a gnarly salvation situation. Ready? Wanting to be remarried, some of them would ignore pastoral counsel, marry unbelievers, or be drawn away into other faiths and abandon their faith. 1 Corinthians 7, 39. 1 Corinthians 7, 39. This is a verse I was talking about. Look at it. If you're single, look at this verse. Do not find your date on a swipe left, swipe right. You look hot tonight, dating site. You know, the best way to find a mate is be at a place where people are doing the same things that believe the same things you are. I would never say a church should be a dating site, but I would say this. The majority of the people you want to find Go to the place where the majority of those people you want to find are believing the same things you believe. And you'll be amazed how God goes, ding, you look hot. I think I might have found my husband. Thanks, Jesus. I'm not saying every dude at church is a Christian. What I am saying is when you're looking in other ponds and other oceans for fish that are far from God, don't be surprised if you get drawn away from God. Look at this. 1 Corinthians 7.39, a wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, which is what we're talking about here in this context, she is free to be married to whomever she wishes. But what? Only in the what? Marry whoever you want. I'm going to do a dating series at some point. Let me break this down for you. There is no the one. I'm looking for the one. That's a made-up American Disney garbage. There is no the one. It's just the one you choose. Which is why it says you can marry whoever you want, ladies but only in the Lord. God will bless your relationship if you marry a man of God. You're in for a world of hurt if you think you're going to change a guy. He will not change. God, God has to change him, and you have no idea if he can change, uh, if he will actually come to the Lord. So let me help you in this area. Many of us were unsaved uh, before we got married. Both of you guys were unsaved, and then you came to, uh, got married. One of you got saved. Scripture says, stay in that marriage. Because your influence in an unsaved spouse's relationship will, will, will be an influencer in their life if they possibly come to Christ. This is in the context of before you choose a mate, make sure they're Christians. Do not marry a person that's not a legitimate Christian. Ladies, don't do it. Let me dad you up for a second. Many of you guys don't have dads in your life or you had a bad relationship with your dad. Nobody gave you guidance. I'm, I'm your pastor. Let me dad you up for a second. Guys will tell you anything to sleep with you. Guys will emotionally manipulate you to get what they want. That's just the bad, what's strong about masculinity are things. And then there's bad things about masculinity. And that's one of them. So ladies, make sure you know who you're marrying. Make sure he loves Jesus. Because he's going to lead your home. He's either going to lead it towards Jesus or away from Jesus. And you will not be able to stop it. Ready? Here's our principle. A Christian woman's highest devotion should be to Jesus. A Christian woman's highest devotion should be to Jesus, not a relationship. I know you want romance. I know you want a deep, you know, meaningful depth of heart relationship with another guy. That's awesome. That's how God built women. But don't get suckered into giving away your relationship with God to be with a guy. Lastly, number three, Christian women use their gifts to be useful to God. Christian women use their gifts to be useful to God. Ladies, you have a gift of God. I don't know what it is. Only you know what that is. We'll help you discover it at the church. We'll help you. Could be working with preschool. Could be working with children. Could be working with hospitality. Could be doing stuff. If you don't like people, you can work back in that corner over there. Like whatever it is. (laughs) Audio, video, whatever you like to do. Be useful. Ladies, God has gifted you. So what is that? Use that gift to honor God. Being taken care of by others, some able-bodied women would become idle. So this is an old English word. Idle means uh, having energy, but not doing anything useful. Any of you guys get a treadmill for Christmas? That's actually a perfect representation of this word. So when we say, you know, they're they're not, they're idle. These These women are idle. What that means is this. It's it's a Greek word, uh, argos, which means inactive, lazy, or unemployed. It means I got a bunch of energy. I could go do something, but I'm not going to do anything. It's kind of like running on a treadmill going, I'm doing stuff, but you're not going anywhere. You're spending a bunch of energy to do literally nothing. So that's the idea. When you are a relational person, like most women are, and you have no relationship in your life because your husband died, but the church is funding you and you don't have to go to work, you know what that does? Your energy has to go somewhere. 
So you know what many times what ladies do is they like to talk. I know that's weird. I can't even believe it. Yeah, it's true. It's like when your wife walks up to you and goes, sweetie, we need to talk about it something tonight. Men are like, I think I'm busy for the next year, right? I mean, women get depth of relationship from talking. While women will talk 10,000 words, dudes are like 10, and it's good. We're good. So it's just, it's how God made men and women differently. So sometimes when women just want to talk about stuff, it says, even in this scripture, they go from house to house, drinking coffee and talking about stuff, which isn't bad unless the conversation is bad, which tends to gossip and then slander. They would use their energy to visit others and chat, spreading gossip and getting involved in other people's business. Timothy was to counsel those kind of women to marry. So in other words, if you're, if you're that re- relationally connected, then get married again. You're young enough, get married again. Stop spending your energy just bouncing around. Start and manage their own homes. Start another family. Manage your own home. Ladies, it can, it can take a lot to manage a home. So use your energies with the good of manage. You know, have more children. We need more godly children in this world. Most of us that grew up in Christian homes, like that was where our faith started. So set yourself a godly home and raise godly children. Use your energy towards the good of of the kingdom. And be hospitable. And here's here's our principle. Women are to use their energy and talents for the good of others. Ladies, use your talents for the good of others. If you have the gift of gab, make sure it's godly. Talk about things that encourage and lift people up rather than just talking about the gospel of the day that tears people down. There's going to be toxic, relationally toxic people in your life you're going to need to get rid of. The way you know you're with toxic people is they're emotionally manipulative. And here's what that means, is when people start talking to you about stuff, about someone else, you start to not like that person, but they haven't even done anything to you. And so after a while, it's like you start not liking that person, but they haven't even done anything to you. You're just going off of what, the, what other people have fed you. You're being emotionally manipulated about that situation. So number one, don't be toxic if you like to speak like that. And number two, if you have toxic people in your life that are like that, who are manipulating you through emotional stuff, you need to remove those people out of your life or call them on and go, I just, I don't want to have this conversation anymore. It's not godly. Sometimes you have to stick a fork in conversations and go, let's move on to some of the other conversation. Because this isn't going in a direction. I don't know that person. You seem to not, you seem to re- be in a real fight with that person. I'm not in a fight with them, but I hope you guys work it out. So stop emotional manipulation in your life. Ready? Believing women are to be helpful and generous so the gospel is appreciated by unbelievers, not slandered. Here's our last principle. A woman with a heart of thankfulness And a desire to honor God leads to others coming to know God and honor him as well. Hey, look at me. Ladies, you have a great gift. My encouragement to you is this. Because ladies tend to be relationally heavy, make sure your relationships are honoring God. If you're married, make sure you're honoring your husband. If you are not married and you want to be married, make sure the man you choose actually loves God. And when you give your heart to him and your body to him, you know you're in a relationship that's safe because it's honoring Jesus. All the relationships you make, ladies, make sure they're focused on the things of God. Make sure your conversation is fruitful for godliness. Make sure all the ways you interact with your friendships and your relationships honor God. And you'll be amazed how you'll be filled with joy knowing that you're being used by God to do great things in other people's lives because you're drawing people to Jesus as you tell others about Christ.